internet, welcome to Game Theory and page 20 of our final FNAF timeline. This is getting ridiculous. Last time we covered William Afton's rise as a serial killer, how the loss of his young son in 1983 caused him to make one fateful promise that would ultimately serve as his driving force for decades. I will put you back together. Fueled by grief and obsession, Afton would lose himself in work and drinks. One night in a fit of rage, he lashes out against Henry's young daughter Charlie, his first murder. This moment becomes the first domino to fall in a long sequence of events that ultimately destroys William's life and the lives of those around him. That one murder gives Afton a taste for blood, resulting in the deaths of ten more children across two different pizzerias. Those children go on to possess animatronics, giving Afton his first exposure to Remnant and the potential solution for bringing his son back to life. The need to learn more about this miraculous power leads him to produce the Funtime animatronics, as well as their capture devices, robots designed to bring kids to him for experimentation and collection of more remnant. Except there was one thing that he didn't account for, his daughter's curiosity. He made the robots too appealing, and it would cost him Elizabeth's life. Now with two children to put back together, Afton was more desperate and crazed than ever, returning to defunct pizzerias to steal the possessed metal still living inside their walls. What he didn't account for, though, were the ghosts, forcing him to pay for the sins of his past. When last we left him, William was springlocked, bleeding to death behind a secret wall. Gone, but certainly not forgotten, as we're about to see in today's video. Today we're finishing up chapter Chapter 2 of our story, wrapping up the Afton era. Over the next six pages, we switch our focus to the other main character of the franchise, Mike, a young boy dealing with the fallout of a stupid childhood decision with tragic consequences. A young man whose life is best described as collateral damage, caught in the blast radius of William's whirlwind of destruction. Now, before we begin, let me just rip off the band-aid now. We won't be finishing the timeline today. I, I know, I know, I'm sorry, I wanted to, but covering FNAF VR, AR, and Security Breach wound up taking me an additional nine nine pages of script, and I've already made you wait long enough for this part, so I just had to make the executive call to break this one up into two. Don't worry, that part is already written, it is already recorded, it is just in the process of being edited. It is a hefty episode. So mark it on your calendar, that one's actually going to be going live on March 25th. It's also coming complete with a live talk back where we go back over everything from the past couple episodes, as well as having ourselves some very special guests. So overall, that one should be a lot of fun. Fair warning though, the conclusions we've reached that solve security breach, whew, they are are controversial. I, I feel good about them. Like, I think that we've locked in on a lot of the answers here, but uh, whoa, they are gonna raise a lot of discussion. Let's just say that you're either gonna love that episode or hate it. I don't really think there's gonna be much in between on that one. Anyway, without any further ado, let's cover a chunk of the timeline that's a lot less controversial. Let's meet Mike. <laughs> William still wasn't back. Weird. Michael knew his father sometimes traveled for work, disappearing for days on end, but usually there was some sort of notice. A phone call, a post-it, something. It's not like Michael and his father were close. Far from it. But as a household of two suffering men coping with years of tragedy and loss, there was at least some element of communication between the two of them. They were united by a name and a shared pain. This time, though, things felt different. William had left nothing. His absence was longer. There were no check-ins, no updates, just silence. Something had happened. If there was one thing Michael knew about his father, it was that he had contingencies, safety checks, backup plans. His father was a careful and guarded man. He held his cards close to his chest, and as such, William had prepared him in the event that something like this ever happened. Normally, his father kept his home office locked, but in the event of an unexpected, prolonged absence, Michael had been instructed to enter his father's office and look behind an empty set of shelves mounted in the corner of the room. Rolling his eyes, Michael entered the office. He never fully understood how William was able to spend so many hours of his days locked up in here. There was just nothing to do. Most of this place was empty. He dragged himself over to the shelf in the corner, expecting to find an emergency contact list, a family safety deposit box. But what he actually found there was completely unexpected. Father, it's me, Michael. I did it. I found it. It was right where you said it would be. The shelf swung open and revealed a giant industrial elevator, one that led straight down into an underground bunker. But, but that was impossible. Hidden inside his childhood home was a secret entrance to an enormous underground science lair? It, it didn't make any sense. Seriously, it didn't make any sense. And yet, here it was, mapped directly underneath the floor plan of the house that he'd grown up in, lost his brother in, been tortured in. Michael thought that he'd known his father, a prideful, sad, angry 
man with petty everyday problems, but clearly he'd been living with a stranger this entire time. His father had secrets. Suddenly the days of William being locked inside of his office made sense. He'd been here the entire time. Where was here though? Was this Circus Baby's entertainment and rentals? The Circus Baby restaurant always did seem to be a deeply personal project for father. A failure of his that cut unusually deep, especially after that first location had to be closed prematurely due to the gas leaks. After that day, father really did seem to change, to lose himself even more in his work. Clearly the entrance he had found was some sort of secret back way into the facility, one that required crawling through vents to navigate. His father had been working here, but in secret. Why? And that's when he found her. At the end of the facility, Circus Baby. His father's pride and joy. Except something was different about her. She wasn't like the others. The way she talked. The stories she told. This wasn't just a robot. She was alive, somehow. And not only was she alive, she also felt familiar. There is something bad inside of me. I'm broken. I can't be fixed. Will you help me? Was this... His sister? William's baby girl? But how? Why? What was this place? He dug around some old files and found blueprints outlining the features of these animatronics. Storage containers, voice mimicking, parental tracking. And was that a child in Freddy's stomach? Was his father collecting and experimenting on kids? Were all the rumors that he'd heard throughout his past actually true? That the animatronics came to life at night? That there were murders done in all the pizzerias? That his father had somehow been the prime suspect in all of it. Suddenly, Michael's mind flashed back to his persistent nightmares throughout his childhood. Had he been experimented on too? Tears stung in his eyes as anger, fear, and confusion filled his body. His father's secrets were pouring out. William wasn't just a lame, overworked father. He was a monster, toying with life itself. Suddenly, everything clicked. He frantically looked around the room, blinking human heads on poles, staring back at him. Green eyes, his sister. Blue eyes, his brother. Closed eyes, his mom. All just just staring expectantly. These were meant to be human. William was working down here trying to make believable humans, literally rebuilding the family that they had both lost. The small little girl robots with their British accents roaming the hallways of this underground facility suddenly took on a whole new context. Hey, I'm in there. Is it the same person? Were those meant to be his sister? A replacement for her? A clone? Was William building clones of his sister? They seemed to know him, after all, to react to his presence. They were all there. They didn't recognize me at first, but then they thought I was you. He always did have a bit of a resemblance to his father. Michael's mind reeled as the reality of his world crumbled to dust. No, no, he had to get them out of there. If this really was his sister, heck, if any of these things were human, souls, whatever remnant of the humans that they once were, they needed to be rescued. They always put us back inside. There's nowhere for us to hide here. Led by the voice of Circus Baby, he marched through the now empty halls of the Funtime Auditorium. He would lead them. He would protect them. And finally, he would be able to forgive himself for the killing of his brother so many years- You are in the scooping room now. The scooper only hurts for a moment. Scooper? That violent extraction arm? Michael had seen that one in the pile of blueprints. Something about heat rendering the magical silver metal inside useless. In reality, prior to getting himself springlocked and put behind the wall, William's methods had become increasingly sophisticated, with a mechanized arm that could infuse new bodies with a soul. William could finally give and take away life. The only thing he needed were the bodies. But William wasn't the only one looking for bodies, as Michael was about to learn. But if we looked like you, then we could hide. If we looked like you, then we would have somewhere to go. Michael was going to be the hero to help these animatronics, all right. He was going to help the haunted tubes and wires of these animatronics escape, just not in the way that he anticipated. His sister had lied to him, another game of pretend. The scooper plowed forward, digging its extraction arm into his body. As he heard his bones ripping through his flesh, Michael blacked out. But something is wrong with me. I should be dead, but I'm not. For the next several months, Michael's life was not his own. He was forced to comply with the tangle of wires and spirits that lived inside of him. His body felt like an overfilled balloon, begging to burst as day by day, week by week, his flesh began to sag and discolor. He was a walking, talking, rotting corpse, alive, but wishing he wasn't. He was a puppet, a walking shell. And while he did his best to conceal his fate, there was only so much a man filled with robot spaghetti could do. The entity in his innards would eventually leave, but by 
that point, the damage had been done. His decaying flesh stank, turning him into a literal purple guy. But still, even with no bones, even with rotting purple flesh and begging to die, Michael continued to live. That silvery metal remnant injected by the scooper meant that he couldn't die. His anger also refused to die. What he had seen down there in his sister's location had rocked him to his core. His father had killed and captured dozens. His experiments had killed his sister and then tortured him throughout all his childhood. He was actively trying to build human replicants. He didn't know where his father was, but Michael knew that he was out there somewhere. I've been living in shadows. There is only one thing left for me to do now. I'm going to come find you. Michael had to correct for the sins of his father. He had to make things right. Michael would burn Fazbear Entertainment to the ground. I mean, what else could you do when your skin was permanently purple? Michael's strategy was simple. He would apply for night security guard positions at the old defunct pizzeria locations. That way, no one ever had to see him or smell him during his shift. And all these old, shuttered locations did need guards. Teenage vandals and squatters were always looking to get inside these abandoned buildings, and yet no one ever really wanted to work an overnight graveyard shift unless they were practically out of options. Enter Mike. One by one, he would take on the job of security guard, changing his name each time to ensure that no one was able to follow his paper trail. Once inside, he could tamper with the animatronics and figure out how they worked, writing about his experiences in his security logbook. While there, he would listen to the old tapes where upper management awkwardly welcomed new recruits to their summer jobs, even though he was working there nowhere near the summer months. He heard the gory details of his father's franchise from the outsiders looking in, confused and afraid about what was happening in the walls around them. Sometimes, he would see his brother in the form of the Golden Freddy suit. It's me appearing on the walls around him. Except now, there was something else there. He was no longer alone. Another, angrier presence was also in the suit, as if two spirits were forced to share the same body. And Golden Freddy would attack him now. It was aggressive. Its vengeance wanted to lash out at anyone with the Afton name. Anyone who wore a security guard outfit. Over time, Mike worked his way through the old restaurants. The original pizzeria, the bigger, better Freddy Fazbear's. He spent weeks there looking for clues as to his father's whereabouts. And each time at the end of his week shift, he would then set the location on fire. Remnant can't survive high temperatures, after all. So burning away whatever spirit-laden animatronics that still existed inside seemed like a winning strategy. All this revisiting of his past, though, was causing the nightmares to begin again. Hallucinations that brought him back to his childhood. The guilt around killing his brother. His dreams were oddly mixed with the shrill phone calls of the security guards. But it would all be worth it in the end. The goal was to eventually, eventually stumble across the one location, the one job that would finally reunite him with his father. Little did Mike know that that day would come sooner than he expected. 2023, an advertisement came across Mike's TV. Fazbear Frights, a new horror attraction inspired by the awful crimes that occurred around Freddy Fazbear's Pizza so many years ago. It made Mike sick. People looking to make a quick buck off the tragedy of others, off his own family. This wasn't a joke or entertainment. Regardless, he had to be a part of it. If this team was combing through his family's history, they might stumble across something that could be useful. And if his father was truly still alive as he suspected, there would be no way that he wouldn't show up here. Maybe finally, finally this could be the final chapter in his family's marathon of tragedy. Mike applied for the job and was immediately handed the keys. Years of doing this had taught him that security guards rarely receive thorough security checks. They also liked how creepy Mike looked. They thought it was a costume, on theme for the job. What little they knew. Hey, hey, glad you came back for another night. I promise. It'll be a lot more interesting this time. For weeks, there was nothing. But just as Mike considered giving up, he received the call that he'd been waiting for for years. You're not gonna believe this. We found one. A real one. Could this finally be him? Sure enough, there he was. William inside his iconic Golden Bonnie Springlock suit. Only now it was green and decaying with age. And there they were, a small family of broken men finally reunited. It's been a long time, Dad. Mike had always struggled with the phantoms of his past haunting him, but now all the animatronics he'd encountered over the past months hopping from pizzeria to pizzeria suddenly sprang to life. Their burned faces haunting him as he tried to keep track of his father on the cameras. It would seem that William's mere presence had put the spirits on high alert. Ultimately, they were harmless, more annoying than anything else, but there was one that felt different from the others, one that was more than just a mere phantom, the security puppet. If he looked at the cameras at just the right moment, he could see it floating there through the halls. He could even see its reflection in the water pooled on the ground. It would seem like... He wasn't the only one there on a mission. While he was dealing with Springtrap, Michael assumed that this one was likely dealing with the spirits of this place, finally setting them to rest. Hopefully this means a happier day for all of us, Mike thought to himself. And in that moment, he felt the air around him release, like pressure being let out of a bottle. The building sighed, as if five spirits had finally been allowed to move on. He had the sense that his brother was a part of them. He rigged the wiring inside the building to misfire, and the dry, desiccated walls erupted in flames. It is finished. 
Except it was not. Somehow, through sheer force of will, Afton remained. He had survived, and Mike would need to find a new way of finishing off his father. Luckily, the solution would present itself later that year. Not from Mike, but from another victim that had been left in his father's wake. We're talking about becoming a Fazbear Entertainment franchisee. Restaurant ownership and management. Something almost anyone can do with a limited degree of success. You are now the face of the newly rebranded Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Fazbear Entertainment as a brand had been closed for years. William had been stuck in a suit and a wall. The only person who legally could bring the franchise back was Henry, but he'd largely pulled out of the franchise around the time of his father's disappearance. Something was up. Surely this had to be some kind of a trick, right? Mike, doing what he did best, applied for a franchise and immediately got the job. There was just one thing out of the ordinary. Paragraph 4. If you are playing this tape, that means that not only have you been checking outside at the end of every shift, as you were instructed to do, but also that you have found something that meets the criteria of your special obligations under paragraph 4. No employment contract he'd ever signed required him to keep special lookout for independently moving animatronics outside the restaurant. Now he knew something was up here. Henry was luring them all back. Rather than trying to go to them, like Mike had done for years, Henry was doing the opposite. He was putting them all under the same roof. He was finishing them off for good. Mike knew this wasn't meant to be a restaurant. It was meant to be a prison, a containment vessel, a locked box meant to trap them all in so they could finally end the madness. It took a few nights, but eventually everyone was there. His father, the puppet, the robot spaghetti that had once violated his body, and his sister, now hopelessly devoted to serve the man that had once gotten her killed. It was time. He had been instructed to seal the doors and leave, but while he locked everything down, he didn't move on. If this was truly meant to be the end, if the remnant needed to be washed away, he needed to be a part of that. This is where your story ends. And to you, my brave volunteer, who somehow found this job listing, not intended for you. Although there was a way out planned for you, I have a feeling that's not what you want. I have a feeling that you are right where you want to be. And to you monsters trapped in the corridors, be still and give up your spirits. They don't belong to you. For most of you, I believe there is peace and perhaps more waiting for you after the smoke clears. Although for one of you, the darkest pit of hell has opened to swallow you whole. So don't keep the devil waiting, old friend. And with that, it was over. The Afton legacy died with all of them trapped inside of a literal box. As the flames danced around the office, Mike, for the first time in decades, was happy. But William wasn't gone yet. Although the darkest pit of hell was open and waiting for him, something or someone wouldn't allow him to move on. Instead, he found himself locked in moments from his past. The pizzeria, his son's room, his underground bunker. It was as if his brain's neurons were all firing at once, overloaded, mixing and matching all his biggest fears, regrets, failures. What was this place? How did he get here? He called out into the silence. <laughs> Then they started coming. Without warning, animatronics both new and old began to jump out at him, bite him, rip him limb from limb. The pain was immeasurable. Make it stop. Make it stop. William, for the first time, longed for death, an end to this torture. Just as it felt like he couldn't take it anymore, everything was quiet again. It was as if the world had been reset. There was a brief moment of quiet, and then the onslaught began again. Dozens of faces from his past all focused on him. A waking nightmare that he couldn't escape from. More pain. More ripping. It was his own personal hell, but why? Why couldn't he just die? And then he saw them, a group of characters he never thought he'd see again. Those janky, stolen characters that had started everything. The mediocre melodies. It had all started to go wrong once they showed up. Once Henry had made them. But mixed in with their obnoxious southern drawls, William heard something else. It was barely a whisper, but he could just make out the words. He tried to release you. He tried to release us. But I'm not going to let that happen. I will hold you here. I will keep you here. No matter how many times they burn us. That voice. He knew that voice, but from where? Greetings from the fire and from the one you should not have killed. The one he shouldn't have killed. William thought back. He'd done a lot of awful things, but there was always the one that stood out. Not Charlie, his drunken act of revenge. Not Susie, his first true murder, no. Instead, it was the one that he had lost control with. The one that he had broken beyond repair for no good reason other than because he could. The one that he'd stuffed inside the golden bear that his partner used to wear. Cassidy. They were back, and now they were trying to punish him. To make him suffer like he'd made them suffer. It was almost like William and Cassidy's souls had been locked together, fused by a collective rage and spite, each refusing.
refusing to move on. But while Cassidy was so focused on taking revenge, they actually did the one thing that would be the downfall for so many others. They kept William alive. Even though fire should have destroyed the remnant that was coursing through his being, Cassidy kept William breathing, paving the way for his escape. William's will was so strong, his soul so powerful that he managed to put a part of himself inside the circuitry that housed the Springlock suit. And there, his consciousness lay, inside a single circuit board, waiting. Waiting for someone to find him and set him free. A person that no one would suspect. Okay, so a bit of a shorter chunk, but an important one as we shift perspectives to Mike and tell his side of the story. And with FNAF VR, AR, and Security Breach having so much to explain, I didn't want to rush through things by trying to cram it all in here. Don't worry, I know you've all been patient. The final video is happening on March 25th. That is locked, it is getting ready to go. Trust me, I want this thing to be over and done with as much as you. I am not just stretching it out for the views. But before we wrap up for the day, I did want to talk about the big Orville elephant in the room, Mike's quest for revenge. You might have noticed that I was vague about the dates, and there's a good reason for that. I don't know them. There is no good way for me to make him fit in. Here's what I do know. We know with a high amount of certainty that Michael Afton is the character that we play as up until Ultimate Custom Night. Mike Schmidt and Fritz Smith, the security guards for FNAF 1 and FNAF 2 respectively, get fired for quote, tampering with the animatronics and odor. So weird connection between the two of them, right? But now, look at the phantom animatronics that are haunting us in FNAF 3. They use models from both FNAF 1 and FNAF 2. Meaning, whoever is sitting in that security guard chair, Fazbear Frights, they have to have seen both locations and their animatronics. And that's not all. Their designs are burnt. It's a weird detail in the game, and it's something that the character encyclopedia repeatedly calls attention to. The burned texture for these phantom animatronics. Why is that so unusual though? Fazbear Frights is the first time in the franchise that we hear about anything burning down. From that point on in the story, it's like the characters turn pyro and are suddenly set in fires left and right, but for the first three games, nothing ever catches fire. The animatronics are just moved or repurposed in some way. So when did they burn? And why would our security guards see them as being burned? Someone has to have been going location to location, setting these places on fire, purging the sins of the past. We know we're definitely playing as Mike and sister location in FNAF 6 based on the in-game dialogue. And in FNAF 4, there's an easter egg where we can hear the phone call from night one of FNAF 1, meaning that whoever's in that bedroom has heard the recording as a security guard. We also know that Mike has seen the nightmare animatronics based on his drawings in the security logbook. So overall, there is solid evidence that connects all of FNAFs 1 through 6. You'll also notice how the character encyclopedia doesn't have a page for Mike Afton. This thing has a page for Chocolate Bunny Bonnie, but not Michael? Some tells me they don't want us to confirm how many games he's been in, because that would confirm too much of the theory. In short, this gives us an incredibly compelling and complete narrative. Mike as our protagonist, and William his father as our antagonist. Mike accidentally kills his brother in Fredbear's mouth, which begins our story and sets William down his pathway of destruction. Mike is then haunted by the guilt of his past and is looking to make things right across the rest of the games. In Sister Location, he learns what his father's been up to and realizes what he has to do to correct it. After failing to finish the job in FNAF 3, he ultimately helps Henry end it all in FNAF 6. It is great. It is a clean narrative. There is just one problem, timing. Mike's quest can't really start until he's been down to sister location, seen baby, and gotten himself scooped. That's when he finds out about Afton's secret life. It's also when he's gonna start to smell, cause you know, he's a walking, talking, rotting corpse. And we know that he's not going down into the bunker until the Funtime animatronics have been made, Freddy's has been closed, and Afton is out of the picture. That all should be happening post-1993 after William is sealed behind a wall. But that then presents us with a few problems. Afton has already dismantled the original animatronics as we see in the FNAF 3 minigames. How are those things getting burned if they're already deconstructed? But more importantly, we see FNAF 2 paychecks with the date 1987. That is way earlier than I think it can be. To be fair, Fritz Smith's pink slip on night 7 doesn't have a date, but it's a bit weird to say that the first few nights are in 1987 and then employee number 3 is hired on years after the restaurant closes. Anyway, just wanted to call that out because I don't have a solid answer for it and I'd love to see your comments down below. And with that, my friends, this chapter comes to a close. We'll see you on March 25th for the grand finale as we cover the final three games in the franchise and the controversial answers we think solves what those games were trying to tell us. Until then, my Faz heads, remember, even though Afton kinda succeeded in being brought back to life, gotta admit, he's still looking a little bit on the dry, dehydrated side. I suppose three fires and being dead for a decade will tend to do that to ya. Fortunately, thanks to today's sponsor, Air Up, I think we can help him out. With the 
hydration thing, not the whole burning alive thing. You guys know that I hate drinking plain water. It's just boring. And that then led me to my current crippling Diet Coke addiction. However, AirUp has found a way to harness the power of science to get me to drink more water. Which, not only do I love in principle, but I can truly say has changed my drinking habits forever. They use these special scent pods that fit directly onto the top of the bottle, and almost as if by magic, it makes the water tastes like basically anything you want. How? If you guys have ever watched Food Theory, you've probably heard me say that smell is more important than taste, and that's exactly what AirUp's taken advantage of here. These pods are full of flavorful smells, like watermelon, peach, wild berry. That one's my personal favorite. And by having the pods in front of your nose as you're drinking, it makes your brain think that that's what you're tasting. But in fact, you're just drinking good old H2O. No additives, no preservatives, no sugars, no syrups, no aspartame, no nothing. I love my AirUp, but naturally, when I tell other people about it, they're skeptical, right? It's a weird concept. So I got members of Team Theorist to try it for themselves, and they were also blown away by the results. Lee, Amy, and Tom, three of our creative directors, they walk around with their AirUp bottles constantly. Lee loves his so much that he even bought one for his brother's wedding present. Tom said that the orange vanilla swirl flavor reminded him of ice creams that he used to eat as a kid, which sounds way more exciting than just plain old water. And the great thing is, if you aren't like me and you just want some good old-fashioned water every once in a while, you just drop the flavor pod down, away from your nose, and suddenly you're back to drinking out of a regular water bottle. The team and I love AirUp. Seriously, there are just so many of these bottles around the office now. And I wouldn't keep saying yes to their sponsorships if I didn't genuinely believe in the quality of the product. So head on down to the description and click the link to purchase your bottle right now. Plus, if you purchase any starter set and use the code FREEFAVE5, you'll receive one free favorite five variety pack. That's gonna get you five one-pod packs of orange vanilla, raspberry lemon, peach, watermelon, and again, my personal favorite, wild berry. That way you get a good sample of a lot of different flavors and you can find the one that's perfect for your tasting enjoyment. Sadly, there's no burning metal or remnant flavors for Afton to enjoy, but I'm sure the others will do the trick. Strikes me as a raspberry lemon kind of guy. So once again, head on down to the description, get yourself a starter pack, and remember to use the code FREEFAVE5, that is F-R-E-E-F-A-V number five, no spaces, to get your free favorite five variety pack. Experience how crazy awesome a water bottle can really be. And as always, my friends, remember, it's all just a theory. A game theory! Thanks for watching.